Dr. Tim Stone, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, lovely, Naomi. Lovely to talk to you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Of course. Um, you're very well known in the UK in the nuclear industry um, right now as chairman of the Nuclear Industry Association and the Nuclear Risk Insurers, but formerly in a bunch of other very important roles, including uh, one involving the plant uh, pictured behind you. But before we get into all of your successes, how about we talk about uh, where you grew up, uh, where you're from? Sure. I'm, I have to, I'm very lucky. I, I am uh, at that point in life where I'm doing things I'm interested in with people I like, and it's fantastic to be able to do that. So um, I grew up in the north of England um, near a big city called Sheffield, which is where the steel industry really first started. And my parents uh, were there basically because of the steel industry and coal, and all of my um, ancestors moved up there from various other parts of the country <clears throat> in the 19th mm. century. Um, so what did your parents do in the steel and coal industries? So my dad eventually was a um, training guy. So he's tra he was a training guy in the coal industry. And my mum ran um, what used to be called in those days the Youth Employment Service. So that was the part of uh, the Department of Work and Pensions trying to help people get jobs when they left school. Uh, mm, in fact, gotcha. my dad did that for a bit when he left the Air Force. <clears throat> and that's where they met. But oh. So it's uh, all very cute, really. Um, yeah. But definitely a Yorkshireman, <clears throat> and uh, not much of the accent is generally left when you hear me in occasions like this. Yeah. If you put me with another Yorkshire person side by side, you wouldn't understand me very quickly. <laughs> we'll have to do a test of that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, and then what did you study in university? You went to university? Yeah, I went to Oxford, and I'm basically a geek. I, I always have been. <clears throat> I originally went to study chemistry and then specialised in... Uh, latterly in both physical chemistry and then sort of theoretical stuff. So um, I was a diatomic spectroscopist, which for mm. at least for this audience, I can I can say that and people don't go, oh my God, what's that? Um, <laughs> and I taught for, I taught physical chemistry for one of the Oxford colleges, um, but I also then taught classes for my own college as well. And mm. I love teaching. The way it works in Oxford, <clears throat> when you teach um, one of the three disciplines, you teach two students at once, so there's no big classes. There are lectures for that. But the wow. primary teaching is done with two students. And so each, so each week you have a pair of students um, at a time to deal with whatever topic you're doing that week. And in the summer term, I managed to arrange it so when the weather was good, I, I taught outside in the university parks in front of the cricket pitch next to the beer tent with a bright <laughs> student on each side and they paid me to do it. And it's kind of gone downhill for a long time since that. I loved it. Yeah, that sounds amazing. How, how would that ever go downhill? Uh, <clears throat> only in the sense that I actually work quite hard and you don't get to sit in front of a beer tent and a game of cricket <laughs> when you're doing your day job most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds amazing. How many students would you, uh, you know, go through a year on that one on, or two on one basis? So you, you teach uh, 10 in a year. Um, we have the biggest chemistry group uh, in our college, uh, and any year in each college is only about 10 students, maybe in some colleges even less. So it's, yeah. ver it's very focused, very personalized. Right. Um, but there's lots of colleges. That's amazing. Yeah. And so did you know sort of what you wanted to do in with chemistry? Was it always a specific focus on one uh, specific chemistry? or It was always the physical side, always the, the sort of quasi-theoretical stuff. Um, and I, my basic original plan was I wanted to be a university guy forever. I wanted to work in the lab and do research and teach. Uh, <clears throat> and I am sometimes really very stupid. And it took until quite late on to realize that the guys who taught me were only 10, 12 years older. And uh -huh. they had tenure. And I was going to be hanging yeah. around for a very, very long time before I got a permanent job. Right. Uh, and so it was, it was at the end of my <clears throat> doctorate when I was about to start thinking about getting married, thinking about what employable skills I had. Because as a diatomic spectroscopist, nobody is going to hire you. There's no practical use that for anybody. It's great for research, mm -hmm. but nothing else. <clears throat> and so the two employable skills I had um, were I'm still a very keen double bass player, and I thought about doing that professionally. <laughs> Thank goodness wow. I didn't. But the other one <clears throat> is I did bucket loads of computing even back then, because that was basically how you did the, the maths. 
And right. so I, I realized all of a sudden that actually that was a, an employable skill. So my first job was with, with what is now Accenture writing ah. IT systems. So I started out as an IT geek. Yeah. Was that a hard transition from academia to industry? Or Oh, it's shocking. It, it was just, just mind-blowing because I had no idea how business worked. So I, 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 I remember thinking when Mars sell a Mars bar, they have worked out to the nickel, to, to the, the micro penny, exactly what it cost. Right. You know, all the components, the labor, the shipping, the packing, the lot. <clears throat> and then they added a little bit on for the profit. And the idea that you might sell it for a lot more than that, or sometimes less than that, just never dawned on me. I had no idea how business worked. So that was the big shock. Mm-hmm. So going in to do IT for big companies, I, my first job was in the treasury, then I did stuff with insurance companies and with a big supermarket. But everywhere I went, it was, my God, this is how business works. This is really weird. Because, of course, it's not scientific. Right. It's to do with people and behavior. Um, and so it's just utterly irrational when you're used to measuring the world in you know, nanoseconds or uh, grams or whatever it is. The world isn't like that. And so that right. took me probably about a decade to really get my head around it, uh, by which time I changed job anyway. But that was... That was a real shock. I had no conception. Yeah, good to have that learning experience. That was and fun. so you said you went to the Treasury next? So my, with, with um, what was then Arthur Anderson, <clears throat> the first big job I worked on was in the Treasury in, in British government. And in those days, we had really high inflation. And the mm. way they tried to manage the government's budget was they set cash limits on different bits of expenditure and they were they were completely disconnected from the way that the normal accounting and management worked in government. And so it was about how do you create a different accounting system mm. that keeps the old one intact, but then imposes these cash limits across different blocks. So we had to build an entire new budgetary system for the government. And That's a huge job. <laughs> it was. And when we started, um, the budget in those days was um, sometime in March and this system had to be up and running for the day that the, the finance minister, the chancellor, stood up and said, here is my budget for the new year, and here are the cash limits, which people have to stick to. And the system had to be ready and going. So there's, there's no case of, oh, it's running a bit late, oh, I'm terribly sorry. <clears throat> it just had to right. be done. So that was quite entertaining as well. Um, yeah, high-pressure jobs you've had. <laughs> that was fun. That, that was fun. I, I, I these days don't do stress, but it was, it was, a, it was a really good way <clears throat> of of um, starting to see how a, you know, a real professional discipline worked. And right. I have to say the Arthur Anderson training was fantastic. So <clears throat> that was a, um, a, a much easier way than it might have been to start out. Yeah. And then what introduced you to the world of nuclear energy? Oh, I had a, <clears throat> a long transition before I went anywhere near nuclear. So after um, Arthur Anderson, um, part of what I did in uh, sort of in the spare time in between jobs was I built a big financial modeling system um, that we sold to about 160 banks in London. <clears throat> and it was a way to price the uh, leases of things like ships and aircraft and oil rigs, so big, expensive assets. And there are all, there used to be all sorts of tax advantages to leasing the things rather than buying them. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we built a really good model that was very good at pricing them, <clears throat> sold it to, I said, a lot of banks. And one of them came along and said, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> came along and said, um, how do you fancy coming to run our software that we have in the US where it's a real business? <clears throat> and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I did. And with a, Had you ever been to the US before? Only to Chicago for training. And okay. of course, Chicago is either boiling hot in the summer or unbelievably cold in the winter. <clears throat> right. So I had no idea. And uh, with a seven-month-old son, a border collie dog, <clears throat> and a wife who couldn't <laughs> then work in the States, we moved there in January 84. Um, to work in what was then Chase Manhattan, um, <clears throat> took the model that they had, um, rebuilt great swathes of it to change the way that the modeling worked to make it much more accurate and more able to win bids. Um, and then realized that I understood the numbers pretty well. And what the bankers were doing on their side of the deal actually wasn't that hard by comparison. And so I then moved over and got more and more involved in the deals and ended up running the leasing business for Chase internationally. Amazing. Um, I then moved the team to a UK investment bank, came back here. Long stories with that. 
then got involved, and I will get to nuclear in a minute, then got involved in lots of um, projects and project financing for all sorts of infrastructure stuff. And on the way past, started working more and more with the government on these big projects. Um, in 2003, the government put me on the board of the European Investment Bank <clears throat> as the British director, um, because I understood big projects and the British government director had to be someone who understood that because the EIB board has to approve all the loans. So um, that was quite useful. Then I did a rail review, led a rail review for the government in 2004. Um, and then for no particular reason, I started thinking, well, you know, people are starting to talk about carbon and we're going to need some more nuclear power stations. So I wrote a, a paper for Treasury just saying, this stuff's going to come back. And by the way, this is what you have to do to build the things. Mm -hmm. And didn't really think any more about it. And then there was an NG White paper and the government said, um, looks like we're going to have to build some more nuclear. And then in 2006, I got a, I was taken out for a drink by a civil servant who said, um, uh, we've put your name forward to help figure out how we're going to deal with the waste and decommissioning from mm. new nuclear power stations. Hope you don't mind. And I kind of <laughs> said, well, what have I done to deserve that? Anyway, I didn't hear any more about it until about a couple of days before Christmas. I got a phone call to say, you remember that conversation we had back in October? Um, you're starting on the 2nd of January. And I said, <laughs> well, I haven't applied or put in a CV or anything. Um, oh, no, we've got all that. Um, and we've looked at you and looked at the others, and you're by far the best guy for the job. And I went back into the office and I said, uh, guys, I, um, I appear to have been seconded into government. And <laughs> the office were kind of nervous because it was nuclear and what's going to happen. And okay. um, I then went into government nominally part-time to sort out waste and decommissioning. And then it just sort of growed from there. And once I was in, um, because I'm a practical guy and understand projects, and the scientific background is really useful because I could understand the technical detail. Um, right. And it just sort of, it grew from there. And I'm, I've always been Ever since I was eight years old, I actually wrote a piece for school when I was eight, actually about the thing behind me. When Calder Hall opened, I remember as an eight-year-old getting a book out of the library that explained how a nuclear reactor worked. <clears throat> and I already at that point, I knew what atoms were and molecules. And I, I kind of had an idea that atoms were made up of protons and neutrons and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and it sort of made sense. And I wrote a piece for school, you know, for my homework for class and ended up drawing the diagrams of control rods and <clears throat> fuel rods and graphite on the board. Wow. Um, and it just seemed entirely rational and practical and sensible. And so ever since then, I mean, my view had always been that at some point, gas will last for so long, but you're going to end up with electricity. And so nuclear has always been there at the back of my mind. And when I was yeah. then actually brought into government, it was, uh, well, how can I help make this stuff happen? So that's right. kind of how, how I became involved. But it was from coming to government to try and deal with one particular problem. And then if I say being let loose like a kid in a candy store, I don't mean that quite as flippantly as it sounds, but so much to do. And, you know, between um, the civil servants who I knew, as it happened as well, so got on with them, it was clear that we were going to have to do a lot of things to help prepare the ground to let people build new nuclear. Um, right. And so it's things like um, producing the white papers that allows the legislation to come through like um, figuring out how to deal with planning permissions, uh, like looking at the regulator to see if the regulator's got the capacity and is structured properly to do this stuff. Because we're not built in the mid, since the mid-90s. And much of the nuclear industry was just sort of fading away quietly, apart from the decommissioning work. Mm -hmm. So it was you know, kind of how do you restart an entire industry? So there's right. lots of fun. And I wasn't a civil servant and I was absolutely was never a politician. I didn't work. I'm, I've got no, I don't do politics. I keep right out of it. But I knew the politicians and was a, I was directly advising the minister. And for the first four years, I was jointly advising the minister in the en energy ministry. Well, the ministry responsible for energy and the finance ministry because it was a joint appointment to sort out waste and decommission. And they kept me on in both roles as the nuclear work evolved. So it was just, I was just very lucky that I was able to use all my tech, my scientific background to understand the context, but also my finance and deal background 
to understand what we had to do to try and make this stuff actually work in practice. So I, I right. was I was very lucky. Yeah. And you're you're very necessary because we do need some innovative financing and some, you know, really hash out plans for rolling out the new nuclear. We do. And it's it's really interesting when you stand back. The last big thing that governments did around financing was privatization, where we took things yeah. that the states had built, sorry, the state had built, and sold them out into the market. And there's been in many countries for the last 30 years this general idea that the markets will sort things out. And if the markets aren't working, it's because you've got the wrong market, so invent a new one. Mm-hmm. And actually, what you've realised is that with the pace and scale of change that we now have to deal with climate change before we get anywhere near net zero, there are actually limits to markets. There's mm-hmm. only so much the market can do. Um, in the UK, a, um, a listed company is generally known as a PLC, which is a yeah. public limited company. And the L in PLC, the limited bit, is where you hit problems. You know, if, you, if you're going to be doing 10, 15, 20 billion dollar programs, there aren't many companies on this earth that can f- shoulder that level of risk. And mm-hmm. actually, when you stand back, governments around the world are always in a position where an irreducible and inescapable obligation for them is to make sure that nationally significant infrastructure is actually there and it's developed and it's maintained and it's supported. They don't have to do any of it, but they have to make sure it happens because without it, countries' economic competitiveness suffers. And that's kind of where we now are. And, you know, with the decarbonisation drive, you're, you're dealing with two different problems. You're trying on the one hand to keep the cost down, but on the other mm-hmm. hand, keep the carbon down. And keeping carbon down puts cost up. So balancing that and actually thinking it through is too complicated for a market and I think actually even with a big carbon price, it would have to be a really big carbon price to drive the changes quickly enough to hit the time scales that we need. So there are all sorts of changes that are going to go on around the world as we adapt to all this, because the pace and scale of change is like nothing we've seen really since the Second World War, maybe even before that, if ever. Because mm-hmm. to get all that carbon out, it's hard enough to get down to 80%. To get down to 100% reduction that last little bit is going to be monumentally difficult. So nuclear, there is no way you can do this. I cannot imagine any possible route that you can't do it without a lot of nuclear in the mix. And the harder you try and drive the carbon out, the more nuclear you need. Right. So are you, uh, you know, sort of insinuating that it should be both of the government and private investors' responsibilities to finance these projects um, rather than just relying on private investors to finance the projects and for governments to set essentially the goals that the projects would accomplish? Governments have to make sure that the process starts. So if you go back to, um, I worked on carbon capture and storage and all sorts of renewables as well when I was in government, so not just nuclear. And to make those work, governments helped a lot at the beginning. And they helped initially by providing big subsidies to to make investment look really attractive. So market price in the UK for electricity is about £40 a megawatt hour. The early price that we offered in to solar was £440 a megawatt hour just to get it going. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you build more and more and more of the same stuff, the cost comes down. The schedules become more predictable. Um, That's happened in, in many countries in the world outside the UK on nuclear. It happened here on renewables, and we have to make it happen on nuclear. And it's, But it's the starting point that's the hard bit. And with big nuclear, with gigawatt-scale nuclear, when you're talking um, you know, $15, $20 billion, that really is hard. There, aren't, there are no com- companies that can do that on their own. So you've got to find a way of spreading it out. But once you get to a point where, A, the costs are coming down, and I am as certain as I'm sitting here that the numbers can come down to the numbers which the renewables guys are now talking about without the intermittency Mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. But once you get down there and you've built several of them, the investments themselves at that point where you know that you can build them and you know that they're going to work are wonderful assets for pension funds, for infrastructure funds. Because if you think about the, um, the investment needs of a pension, you need things that pay out over a very long period of time. You need -hmm. need things that pay out um, not just, over a 10-year period, but over 20, 25, 30-year period. And so nuclear <clears throat> projects are wonderful assets for pension guys 
once you know that the risk <clears throat> of delivering them is sensible, is manageable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's how we get to a point where we have um, basically a mechanised process. So I, when I gave speeches working in government, I said, <clears throat> for nuclear, I want a, a car production line. I want the things coming off the end, one after another, after another, after another, the same colour, you can't change the wing mirrors, exactly the same. And right. that's how we get the cost down. And the big picture behind all this <clears throat> is with the changes that we're driving through. If we get it wrong, we're actually going to be damaging national economic competitiveness. If our power in the long run, if our energy is too expensive, industry will go somewhere else. If you look at what happened mm-hmm. a couple of years ago at the height of the um, Bitcoin boom, the, the primary cost of mining Bitcoins is electricity. Mm-hmm. And where did it all end up? Big amounts of it in Iceland and in China, because that's where the cheap power was. That's what happens. Right. And we're moving into a world where electricity is right at the heart of all the new um, developments. So whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's um, heating the places, heating our homes and heating industry on a low-carbon basis, you need electricity to do it. And you need right. cheap electricity. And if your electricity, your energy is too expensive, you're not competitive. So that's the kind of scale that we're looking at. And the decisions we're making today will affect our children and particularly grandchildren. It's that sort of duration. So, you know, the big nuclear power stations, they've got design lives these days of 60 years. They'll probably get 20-year life extensions, maybe even 40. Who knows? But they're not going to be dropping off in 40 years' time because they've been designed specifically for that long run. So it's a very different world altogether. One of the battles we have is that the general perception of nuclear is it's old technology because it's been around since 1956. Well, mm-hmm. it, it has, but so has um, wind power in a sense. We've, we've, we've known about wind turbines for donkey's years. What we haven't done is to really industrialise them and make them very efficient. That's what right. we now need to do with nuclear. We need to also be much more involved with smaller stuff and turn it into a manufacturing industry. We need to produce product that people can buy, that companies can buy, that energy companies can buy, that infrastructure investors can buy. Because at the moment, the way we build big nuclear, it's a bit like going down to the the tailor for a bespoke suit. You know, uh, they charge you an absolute fortune. It might fit beautifully and it looks lovely, but it is eye-wateringly expensive. We just Mm -hmm. need to stop this. The other industries have become much more sophisticated at producing products. So if you think back, when I first started work, Computers were big, monstrous machines in big rooms with air conditioning and were monumentally slow. And then um, uh, Bill Gates came along and Steve Jobs and people like that. And they dreamt up the idea of a motherboard with a load of sockets in it and a socket mm-hmm. where you put, put the computer chip itself, where you can then have different manufacturers making different performance computer chips. And you can have different graphics cards and different sound cards and different network cards and you plug them in. Why can't I? effectively go to Amazon and buy myself a 500 megawatt kettle, because that's all it is to produce the steam, and a 500 megawatt turbine and generator and plug them together. Why are they always so intricately bespoke? They're not products. The wind guys have produced products and they have a catalogue of standard stuff. Why aren't we doing that? And we aren't doing it because we've had nuclear engineers who've been let loose provide designing really clever geeky stuff all the time but yet at the end of the day if you stand right back nuclear power is about generating electricity it's about boiling water to spin a turbine to spin a generator that's the outcome so how can we do that as efficiently effectively and competitively as possible and get Mm -hmm. those prices down to where other countries have you know Abu Dhabi has done a really good job the South Koreans Japanese at home the Chinese now the Russians and we can do it, but because it's that bit more expensive, it's just a harder starting point. So that's kind of where we are. And um, this is all part of an international economic competition. We have to do this in the UK. The US has to do it in the long run because the shale gas, A, isn't going to last forever. But more importantly, we can't just keep on burning this stuff. Right. I mean, other little thing that has always struck me as, as odd is that natural gas, whether it's out of the North Sea here or shale gas, is a really good, pure, organic chemical. It's a great feedstock for making plastics and pharmaceuticals and other chemicals. Mm-hmm. Why are we burning it? Yeah, right, How, it's it a was, good resource for other just, things. It's just irresponsible. You know, again, imagine the grandchildren. What happens if you don't have that nice supply 
of cheap, high quality organic chemical to go into the, the, the production chain to make the pharmaceuticals. The next cheapest source of organic chemicals is sugar. What are we going to do? Grow bucket loads of sugar to make pharmaceuticals. Where are we going to put it? So there's a, again, I hope this starts to make people think a bit about the long-term consequences of behavior because all the gas that we burned is, is feedstock for the petrochemicals pharmaceutical business that won't be there. Mm-hmm. Was that a wise thing to do? I'm not sure it was. Right. So very so I have, yeah, yeah, extremely interesting. I have a bunch of questions to ask you on those topics, but I guess because you do come from such a financial background, my first question for you, um, you know, you touched on it a bit, talking about how um, a lot of people in the nuclear industry are focusing on geeking out on the technology and making really cool new nuclear technologies. But what we need to focus on is making the the nuclear cheaper in the first place. Um, and so do you, why, why wouldn't you just say, why don't we just not make any new technologies? We use all older designs for these large plants and try to get more of a production line going for, you know, the material, the components needed to hmm. build those plants. On big ones, I, I agree with you. At this point, we have enough big designs that are built and proven. Why invent mm-hmm. any more? I hope, I hope to goodness nobody designs any more big reactors. Let's just take the ones we've got and globally find out which ones are the most efficient to build and operate and just stick with them. And not one single one, because clearly mm-hmm. nation states won't let that happen. But we do not need a big fleet. So when we started the energy policy back in 2007 here, we were mm-hmm. looking at two or three designs. That's it. A long run fleet of two or maybe three designs, but no more. Because you, first of all, you don't want a single one because you don't want the, um, the the concentration of risk in that single design. But if you have more mm-hmm. than a couple, then you end up with a badly fragmented supply chain that isn't as efficient. Right. The other part of this too, in the medium term, is that the more that we can use standard parts, the better. So one of the things that I find still to this day intriguing is that you'll often find the same pumps and valves used in different industries being used again in nuclear with bucket loads of data and documentation behind them, but you have to go through all the licensing of that unit again. And we end up in many cases where the paperwork weighs more than the component. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Why can we not just stand back and look at the data that we have and only do the extra work in validation that we actually need. We have to be much more disciplined about treating this as a product and treating mm-hmm. it as a manufacturing process and less of a bespoke process. I completely agree. On the smaller ones, as, we, as these things come through, whether they're smaller, large reactors or advanced reactors, I hope that the whole focus is working backwards from that idea of a product. How do I produce a product that the client wants to buy that is as cheap as possible to build and operate and as reliable as possible whilst meeting all the safety standards. And on the safety standards, we know what those are. We understand that really well. We don't Mm -hmm. need to make it even safer. They're already, in terms of things like deaths per terawatt hour, nuclear is so much better than almost anything except hydro and in some cases, possibly solar. But I mean, just Mm -hmm. as a really daft example, Um, the death rates per terawatt hour hour are much higher for rooftop solar than they are for nuclear Mm -hmm. because the safety Mm -hmm. standards in rooftop solar aren't very good and people fall off the roofs and and get killed. Right. You know, we, 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 we need to just stop obsessing about safety and we need to deal with it. We are, as an industry, it is already very safe. I'm not ever saying that we, we take off, uh, the focus, but you don't need ever, 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 ever more safety. We, we need right. a better understanding in the minds of the general public about uh, what the safety implies. And that's a hard issue because, uh, in general, people are not very good at assessing risk. If we were, we'd never drive a car. It's really dangerous. Yeah. We'd fly everywhere. You know, right. It's those sorts of <laughs> things. But the perception that you have of being in control in the car makes you think that you're safe. And we need to help somehow deal with this and maybe – the, the whole climate change net zero process will, will focus people's attention on what is the safe way uh, to drive low carbon systems through and, and actually get people to think about it a bit more. But we need education. We need it in schools. We need kids you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old 
thinking about this, being being aware of the consequences. And I, I want to see back in schools a lot more understanding of basic nuclear physics. So as a kid in high school, um, part of the experimentation we did was we actually had a cobalt-60 source and a Geiger counter. Oh, wow. And we played with it. It wasn't something the teacher did up at the front. We were in pairs and you had a cobalt-60 source, Geiger counter, and the teacher said, right, when it's all set up, you take the little shield off the front of the cobalt-60 source and sure enough, the Geiger counter goes bzzz. <laughs> then you put a sheet of paper in the way and it slows down. And you put a sheet of aluminium foil in the way and it slows down even more. But it kind of demystified it a bit. Yeah. And we've got, we're, we're just too, we're overcautious in schools. We don't let kids see this stuff. Um, as a chemist, part of what made me just go, oh, wow, this is really cool, was the smells and the bangs and the pops and the colours and the things that you did in chemistry experiments. And right. these days, so much of it is done in fume cupboards or it's done by the teacher with the, the students at the back of the class keeping a safe distance. I mean, <laughs> there's no engagement. And it's, it also means that, that you're not becoming aware of risk and how to manage risk well enough as youngsters. Right. And that goes through into later life. So we have to deal with that. But going forwards, back to the, the, the bigger question, we don't need ever more designs. We need the ones that we have to be really polished so that they are produced on time and on budget and ever cheaper and ever cheaper by making it more productive, not by cutting corners at all. But mm. the, the biggest issue is just productivity. And the more we can make them, uh, particularly the advanced reactors and smaller ones, <clears throat> made in factories with much higher quality of um, manufacture than stick-built construction, that's the way to go. But I want to and see some product. Yeah, and I mean, how close are, are we to getting there um, in the UK? How close are you guys to actually making these more easily uh, produced or even demonstrated to begin with? Um, <clears throat> the government at the moment is in the middle of a process looking at um, taking forwards up to four advanced reactors. Uh, there are seven currently in the, in the process, and we are subject to politics, um, very close to announcing which four are going forwards. And the government will put money in to help drive the development of those, some of them more mature than others. Um, so there is a clear focus here on, on helping that through. But it, is, this isn't an, it isn't just for the UK. I'd like to see much more cooperation with other countries, not ever saying, let's all just do it as one because life gets too complicated. The diplomacy is just too difficult. But at least <laughs> making sure that the companies talk to each other, right. the regulators talk to each other, and that we learn together. That's what we need. We, don't, we do not need a British, Canadian, American, French, Chinese, German, whatever version of the same thing. I don't care what colour you paint it. I don't care what colour flags on it. But we need to have common supply chains, common designs, common approach to regulation. So what I don't want to see is different regulators requiring changes to the same design. So mm -hmm. one of the great things that we're already seeing is, is a wonderful degree of cooperation between the British regulator and the Canadian regulator, both of whom work in very similar ways. And the more that they can share their experiences and kind of mark each other's homework and take comfort from the work that each other does, the more efficient we can make it. Yeah, that's great. And are there any roadblocks right now to making that supply chain run smoothly and efficiently? I think probably the biggest roadblock at the moment is confidence. Hmm. The industry as a whole is pretty pretty much suffering from lack of trust and confidence within themselves with governments around the world because of all the political changes that have happened. So restoring that is really important. The industry as a whole hasn't got that much work, so it's kind of bumping along the bottom. And mm -hmm. when you're in that state as a company, you scrabble for every little bit of, bit of work you can, and there's, there's not much public spirit around. I mean, there's a bit, but there needs to be a lot more, and that comes with a better... Uh, workflow and a, and a better profitability and a better attitude. So as the work starts to improve, I think we will get a better degree of cooperation. I mean, in the UK, the uh, the Industry Association has got great support from the members, and they are being very positive because they can see where this is going to go um, with net zero. So mm -hmm. it's 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 past the bottom; it's on the way back up again. <clears throat> but it's also part of what governments have to do. Creating that trust and confidence is partly about governments saying. We can see that we need this, go do it. And then not to say in five years' time, do you know what, change my mind? You can't mm. do that. There's no, yeah. uh, as I, I said to somebody the other day, if you look carefully in the Oxford English Dictionary, there is no such verb as to uncommit. 
You have to pick, you have to say what you're going to do and stick to it. And if you do change your mind, you've got to be very aware of the consequences it mean it will create for the industry. And right. restarting an industry is really hard. If you restart it and then cause it to stop through lack of trust and confidence or because you changed your mind or you dithered, restarting again is even harder. So going back to my point earlier on about governments ultimately bearing responsibility for ensuring that nationally significant infrastructure is built and is maintained at a sensible price. That's about trust and confidence. It's about <clears throat> governments making their minds up and sticking to it and actually being honest with people and not pretending that they can change their minds. Now, here, politically, we've been, in, we've, we've been very lucky because the, the politics has been pretty good over the last decade and a bit in that the major political parties have both been okay with nuclear, mm -hmm. but we need to do more. The industry needs to do more. We need, we need some successful build and operation happening because, as they say, nothing succeeds like success, and the sooner we can get things up and going, the better. Yeah. So would a big step towards that to be, uh, you know, t devising more practical policy or how can we accelerate that? Uh, it's, it's first of all, government being clear about their objectives. So at some point there'll be an energy white paper out. I don't know when it's been promised for about now. We'll see. But when it comes out, I hope, I really hope it's clear in saying, given the challenge of net zero, this is the no regrets level of nuclear that we need. Mm -hmm. you know, a good chunky number that people can go, yep, that makes sense. I understand why you've said that. And I now trust you that you'll stick to it. And so government, when they say that, have got to be quite clear in everything they do that they mean it. And on the back of that, then there's the financing issue. So we're looking at different ways of financing new large projects. Smaller ones will become much easier anyway. But we need to think quite hard about how we get them, get the whole process going <clears throat> to prove that it's doable at sensible prices. And I, as I said earlier, I've got no doubt that on a fleet build, the electricity cost out of these things is way down with the very latest, the very best of the renewables, which in terms of system cost is, is even better still. So I've got no doubt that that's where it goes, but you've got to do it. And it's how we build that confidence. And we just get on with it. That's the challenge for the politicians, the civil servants, and for industry and the shareholders to be brave enough that when the government says, we need this, Industry and shareholders go, okay, I trust you. Yeah. I need that. We need that trust back. Yeah, absolutely. So before you had mentioned that when you worked for the government's office for nuclear development, you did a review of the nuclear regulator. What was that review like and what did you determine? So that, that was looking at how effective the regulator is as an organization. I wasn't clearly going anywhere near anything to do with the way they, they assess or implement safety. I mean, so far, not my world. But it was looking at how they operate and how, how they can be more effective. And essentially, it was trying to see as an organization how they could work better. And so part of the consequence of that was that they were taken out from the middle of a government department and made much more independent, much more self-standing with an independent board and on a proper financial footing. And the change in attitude has been wonderful. They are, they are an absolutely fantastic organization. They talk about outcomes now. They mm -hmm. actually talk about the consequences of what they do. Whereas a decade ago, you kind of got the sense that the, um, the ideal nuclear reactor, nuclear power station for the regulator, one that was cold and dark with no fuel in it because there was no risk. Right. Whereas, of course, the risk is a different risk to civil society, that there's no power. And so we now have a regulator who are, who are just wonderful, even down to the point where... Uh, the way that they work with decommissioning, they've been hugely helpful in helping some of the decommissioning sites think about how they can do things better, cheaper, faster, safer, and not just turning a handle on an old process, but challenging them to think. So the idea of focusing on outcomes is wonderful. They nowadays, nowadays talk about and are driving what they call enabling regulation. Mm -hmm. So it's not the dead hand of government sitting there saying, oh, no, you can't, whatever the question is. But, you know, how can they help you to do a good job? How can they help you to operate really safely, but without being stupid about it and actually thinking practically about the solution? So they, you wouldn't recognize them from where they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've also managed to attract some wonderful people in to the organizations, both on the board and in the, um, the teams there. They're, they're a great bunch of guys. And it's probably one of the 
uh, most enjoyable things I've ever done because by just being a little bit pokey and taking on the system, the consequences um, from my perspective are fantastic and I'm really proud of them, what they do. Um, and from my little bit of help, my catalysis as a good chemist, they've moved enormously, they're fantastic. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if you could do a, a sort of compare and contrast around the world, I reckon they're, if not the best in the world, they're, they're up there with anybody else who, who might be vaguely competitive. They're fantastic. And yeah. it's made a difference too to the, to the nuclear companies in that you've got a, a much better relationship with the regulator. I'm not going to say for a minute it's perfect. They never are. Right. Uh, but they're also learning all the time and they're also trying to get better in terms of the consequences and the outcomes of what they do. Yeah, Absolutely. We try to uh, talk to our regulators here a lot to really try to understand what's what's going on in their plans for the future of nuclear because they, they really are the ones who can push the industry forward or hold it back. Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting yeah. that it's a, there's, a, there's a big cultural difference between the way the US works and the way the UK works. The UK regulators are outcome focused. Yeah. It's, it's all about the result. It's not the process. Whereas so much of what happens with the NRC and many other regulators too is about process and the idea that the process is what keeps you safe. Well, that's not the way the world works. You're much better off saying, actually, that is the outcome. That's what has to be achieved. I don't care how you get there. Just be as creative and clever as you can, but that's what you have to do. Right. And the more that you can, actually, it's a really interesting point. If you look at the theory of mathematical optimization, if, you, if you're optimizing something, adding a constraint will do one of three things. It either won't have any effect at all because it's outside the other constraints, or it's there with a bunch of other constraints at the same place, or it makes it worse. Mm -hmm. You do not make things better by adding constraints. Right. And so part of the attitude of a, an enlightened regulator is to look at the constraints and say, which ones of these are actually helpful? Which ones of these are just there because they're there? Mm -hmm. And you want the constraints that you need to keep the, keep the thing safe, but absolutely no more. In any walk of life, when you're optimizing things, get rid of all the constraints and only put back on the ones that really matter and you get mm -hmm. a better outcome. And that's actually where, without ever thinking about the maths, that's what the regulator does here. That's how it works. Yeah. Uh, and they, they've been very good they, they, and they, they are continuing to grow as well. Yeah, but it is difficult because those constraints inherently are linked to the level of risk that you're willing to take on, which for a lot of governments is very little. <laughs> but that, but that's the point. It is what is the, what is the, what is the appropriate level of risk? That's one thing. But then, how do you implement that? What constraints do you put on the physicality of the construction and the operation to achieve that level of risk? Right. And you have to think through quite carefully. <coughs> excuse me. You have to think through quite carefully how those constraints are applied and to make sure that they are as sensible as they can be. And the more that they can be expressed in terms of outcomes rather than mechanisms, the more people think and the more that people will try and think of better ways of getting to the same outcome. Yeah. That's the bit. What you don't want to do is to stifle creativity and innovation by just saying, do it like this, because you then right. end up with people acting robotically rather mm -hmm. than thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. And we definitely need some creativity in our industry now. We do. To get those prices cheaper and get the ch supply chain optimized. Yes, we do. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, we just need that trust and confidence back and then we'll be there. Right. <laughs> and a couple of projects that are actually working. <laughs> that goes without saying. Absolutely. Yeah, we need some ribbons to cut and some new bits of kit to start working. <laughs> yeah. Of all the projects that you have gotten to work on and are are currently working on, what do you think is sort of the most promising project or the one that you're the most excited about? Well, it's got to be the first one down at size at um, at Hinkley, the EDF project. That one is the first build for donkey's years. That's really exciting. They're making great progress. You can see the, see the things happening: monster cranes, concrete being poured, real progress. Uh, they're looking at the next one <clears throat> at Sizewell, which will probably be in a different financing mechanism. Um, it's it's the ones that are going that matter. It's yeah. not it's not the um, the shiny new toy distraction over there. Those are interesting in due course, but you've got to get on with the ones that we're doing, and then use that as part of providing the trust and confidence for the ones that follow. 
And for our listeners who maybe don't know what Hinkley is, do you want to explain that project a little bit? Of course. So if you go back in time, uh, we had we already have a lot of nuclear power stations in the UK, um, but there have been a number of sites that were identified as potentially very good ones for new big reactors. Hinkley is down in Somerset. Uh, there's an old reactor already there um, to be decommissioned, but there's a big site next door, which is um, Hinkley Point C, which is, so it's the third reactor down there, the third set of reactors. Um, it's very close to the Bristol Channel, which if you look at the map of England and, and Wales, on the left-hand mm-hmm. side, below Wales, there's a big channel that comes in, and the water around there is the cooling water that will be used for Hinkley. Um, EDF have owned that site since they bought it from British government, gosh, 2008, somewhere back there. Uh, and it's been one of the very best sites along with uh, Wilver and Anglesey, where for donkey's mm-hmm. years, everybody said that's the place to build. It's down in Somerset, so it's a long way from anywhere because you always put these things on the coast. Um, and uh, EDF started work thinking about that about a decade ago, and they're now charging away merrily. There are thousands of people on site, hundreds of apprentices being trained down there, lots of work being done, and that's the first. And yeah. you've just got to make that a success, and I've got every every confidence that they will because they're a good bunch of guys and they are, they're absolutely dedicated to making it happen. And with the confidence that comes from that, and then the next one, which is Sizewell, which is over on the other side of the country in East Anglia, so the lumpy bit that sticks out into the North Sea, it's over there, mm-hmm. that's the next one. And these two sites are the ones that everybody's going to be looking at to say, oh, this is how we do it. Meanwhile, I hope that as the down select on the advanced reactors, small reactors, goes ahead, that we see one of those starting to be built in the next four or five years, really quite soon, I hope. And again, that will just help build the confidence that this stuff works. And when you look at what other countries do, you know, if mm-hmm. Abu Dhabi can build four big nuclear reactors in a country that had never done anything like that before, if they can do it, we must be able to do it. You know, this right. is a great engineering nation. We were really proud of our heritage. You look back to the railways and the, re- and the canals, all the things that we've done. You know, we produced the first ever iron-hulled ship. We have a fantastic engineering tradition. We should be able to do this. And part of it is, I think somebody said, getting your mojo back and just, <laughs> you know, just having a go. We, we need the enthusiasm. And the EDF guys have provided a lot of that. It's been, uh, uh, it's been fascinating. I, I remember saying to a friend of mine that the chaps who were leading the EDF project reminded me of a couple of guys driving a turbocharged laser-guided bulldozer. They just went on and did it. And that that's what we need. We need that yeah. sort of drive and determination um, and the confidence it then produces. That's what we need. We'll get yeah. there. Yeah. I like your optimistic view. <laughs> well, you have to do. You have to do because it, without it, the UK will not be economically competitive. That, that's the fundamental point. If we're going to drive the carbon down, we have to do this as part of being economically competitive. So it's not kind of a nice to have. You know, I, I've got a couple right. of grandchildren. I want them to have a world where the UK is a competitive nation. This is part right. of that. It's part of the and legacy guys, we leave for them. Sorry, it's part of the legacy we right. leave for them. Yeah, no, it really is. And and you guys just had a new goal implemented, right, for like 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050? So we have um, in the UK an organization called the Committee on Climate Change, which was set up basically to be an independent organization to advise the government on how to deal with climate change. And a few weeks ago, uh, they came out and said that the government should adopt a target of driving greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, to zero by 2050. Um, We were the first country, I think, back in 2008 to legislate for um, an 80% carbon reduction by 2050. This just takes it, if I say the last 20%, that's Mm -hmm. that's the hard 20%. But yes, the, the Prime Minister has actually already enacted through Parliament a legally binding commitment to get the carbon down to nothing by 2050. That's hard. But it does, yeah. it does make the point that um, we are committed to driving climate change and dealing with it. It makes the point that we're going to do something about how we get there. But you are looking at restructuring the whole of the energy industry, domestic mm-hmm. heating, transport, not just cars but road and rail and in the meantime uh, if you think about just cars an example 
within the next decade, we're going to see a rise of a lot of autonomous vehicles to the point where those, I, I believe, will become the public transport system of the future. So mm-hmm. in the way that you deal with Uber now, there'll be the equivalent of that for public transport, but except it won't be owned by the state. But you, you know, I want to go to the shops, boom, on your app, the car turns up, takes you there, beetles off to another job. Right. Where those cars charge will be, and when, will be dictated by the business model of the guys who own and operate those cars. It won't be mm-hmm. about some tweaky time of day pricing on an electricity. It'd be driven by a business model. We have mm-hmm. to think about how do we get the electricity to the places where those cars will charge, which is probably going to be car parks. How do we make sure the electricity infrastructure, which was designed for a very different era, can cope with a very different distribution of demand? So if we were to go for, just for example, if we, if we end up going for electric heating, and I assume that will be um, heat pumps of some variety, air source probably, <clears throat> for efficiency. But if you're going to go for electric heating as well as electric transport, then the final mile, the distribution system, is almost certainly going to need to be significantly upgraded in most places because it was put in for an era where you had lights and a telly, mm-hmm. but you didn't charge cars and you, and you mostly didn't teach your house like that. Right. So even things like if you want to buy a, um, an electric car now that has a big range and therefore a huge current to charge it, in many cases, your ordinary meter in the house won't cope with it. The fuse in the meter will blow. Mm-hmm. So you actually got to think about the whole infrastructure. So it's, it's, it's a very different world altogether. And it's, I can't think of a time where we've had this pace and scale of change that affects all of us. It's really big. And mm-hmm. driving the energy through into the system is only part of it. It's a much bigger job. And with it comes lots of different jobs at a time when um, artificial intelligence will be changing the way that a lot of the workplace operates. So lots of um, conventional middle management jobs become automatable. What do all right. those people now do? Well, we've got to rebuild the energy system and everything goes with it. So lots of different jobs there, retraining. There's, there's a huge opportunity from all this. And that's where the education piece of it comes in, as you were talking about, to really get people educated on the different types of energy and how to how to get involved in the energy space. Absolutely. And one of the things that um, the NIA is looking at is what can we do to help with schools understand the challenges and the opportunities that are coming? And how can we help the teachers explain to the kids and the kids then ask the parents what this all means to tr- actually try and help catalyze that public discussion? Because actually, to be honest, the public discussion about energy is pretty facile still. It's mm-hmm. getting better because of net zero and climate change, but it's still pretty facile. And the the comprehension of energy as a system, with all that that means to engineers, is just not there for most people. Most people assume the electricity comes out of that white socket in the wall, and they've got no idea of what's behind mm-hmm. it. Do you think that part of the reason that people maybe don't pay as much attention as as we think they should or don't understand it, the system as much as we want them to is because it is so daunting and that maybe it's almost worse to try to explain it to them because then it makes it scarier? No, no. The reason they don't understand is because it works. They don't need to. They know that yeah. when they switch the light on, it comes on. They know that when they uh, plug the, the computer into the wall, the power's there. They know it works. It's been, it's been bomb-proof for donkey's years. Right. And so nobody's had to worry about it. And yeah. you know, as a student... Um, that was probably about the last time we had the real problems. We had a, a strike in the coal mines, and this was all politics. And on the back of that, the country went to a three-day week, so power was only available th- for three days a week. Wow. Which was, at one level, quite fun, because as a student, you know, I didn't rely on very much for uh, electrically. And when the power was off, I had a load of candles around the room, which was great. You know, it's a very lovely atmosphere. <laughs> Relaxing. I didn't mind. <laughs> um, but the world is very different to that, very, very different. Right. You know, the, and we uh, won't be able to do that with our cars not running because we don't have electricity. <laughs> and the phone wouldn't work. You know, your, your phone will go flat after a bit. Your laptop will go flat after a bit. I mean, right. you know, and we'd rely without quite realizing on the information and the data that goes with that. You need electricity for it. The world is, is very different. All those connections, you know, as we're doing now, that's how the world works. And it all relies on electricity. It all relies on right. energy. So you can't just oh, you, know, you can't just ignore it and say, well, we'll deal with it at some point because it affects the whole fabric of society. It's the way we live. Absolutely. So, so a very different world. So speaking of the different world, 
Um, as we as we wrap up here, if you could go through, what do you think the energy portfolio should like look like in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years? That's at one level very difficult, but another another level very easy. It's very easy in the sense that um, to hit net zero, there is no silver bullet. You can't just build something. You're going to have to have everything because you can't physically build enough in time, mm-hmm. even if there was a perfect solution. So you need the renewables. You need nuclear. If you can make carbon capture storage work as an interim measure, great. But if you can, probably the best thing to use that for initially is for things like steel and cement, which just by their chemistry produce bucket loads of CO2. Mm-hmm. You know, you, we're not going to replace the steel works around the world with different chemistry. I mean, you can do it differently. You could use hydrogen as a way of making steel from the ores. You can reduce it using hydrogen, but that's a completely different plant. You're not going to do that overnight. There are a world where you can't make cement because it's chucking out CO2. What do we do with that? So we have to find a way of dealing, using carbon capture and storage effectively for the industries which, for which you have no choice. And if that then mm. works effectively for a while, then fine. If it's economically sensible, bolt it onto the end of um, gas turbines, fine. But don't let's pretend that there is a silver bullet. There isn't. You need bucket loads of everything. The, um, there's a supermarket over here which has a phrase it's an, um, to do with, you know, we're a bit cheaper than everybody else. And the phrase is, every little matters, every little helps. Well, actually, mm-hmm. in this context, it's not. It's every lot helps. You can't do this with little bits. We need big chunks of nuclear. We need the renewables guys, wind and solar. As I said, if CCS works great, if it doesn't, you're going to need more of nuclear and renewables. Managing a balanced system at the lowest overall system cost isn't some nice little set of simultaneous linear equations. It's nothing like linear. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, Even things like do we replace natural gas with hydrogen? Very interesting, reuse of the, of, the, of the gas network. But what's the cost of making the gas network leak-proof for monumentally tiny molecules that will get out through absolutely any gaps anywhere? And then mm. replacing all the meters and replacing all the burners in the, in the boilers. And this, is, this is big stuff. So in terms of my big picture, it's a lot of everything. In terms of just how that balance works out, for me, I, I kind of don't care so long as Overall, it is low carbon and it mm-hmm. is low cost to the national economy. But I'm as certain as I'm sitting here that part of that is a big chunk of nuclear. I can't see any other way of simply producing the heft that you need to run a country without a lot of nuclear. Yeah. So two follow up questions for that. Where do you see wind and solar being most appropriate? And I also really appreciate that you explained where you think carbon capture would be appropriate, because I'd never heard it explained like that. And that made a lot of sense. (laughs) Uh, Wind and solar, basically, where's the resource? So we've got some great resource in the UK offshore for wind. Um, If we can politically bring it onshore for a bit, that will help as well. Um, But there are practical limits. I mean, you you can't just paper the countryside with anything. Don't matter whether it's wind or solar or anything else. The UK, from a solar point of view, you know, we've got some some solar resource here, but the UK isn't the place that you stay to get a suntan. If you want a good suntan, you go somewhere else. (laughs) The weather here is famously not, not that wonderful, so it helps. But there's no point pretending that if you just put more and more solar up, it'll get better and better. There are quantum mechanical limits as to how much... Um, sunlight you can convert into electricity and the panels now are really efficient and pretty cheap but they're flattening off and Mm -hmm. if some clever piece of quantum mechanics means we can get them a bit cheaper great every little is necessary but it's uh, it's interesting one of the things about nuclear is that in terms of the power production per piece of space nuclear is about 400 times more efficient use of space now in the States, you've got a lot of space and you've got a lot of space where there aren't many people and there's a lot of wind and sun. Great. Here you don't. To get a mile away from another person in this country is really hard. We don't have lots of spare space and the space that we do have, it'd be quite nice if we actually grew some food as well. So actual rational economic use of space is good. So that's that's one of the issues, one of the reasons why nuclear is a good part of this. But the renewables guys have got an important part to play as well. It's, it's important that we carry on supporting them 
and that we don't we don't ever end up in any sort of them and us type conflict. It's not. We are all in the same same boat. We all need each other to make the whole thing work. Yeah, absolutely. And then the second thing that you mentioned is um, that we need a mixture of of all of these different energy sources to get to you know a low carbon future. Do you think that it would ever be possible to get to a net zero carbon or even a net negative carbon future? It's hard. I I hope to goodness it is, but it's really hard. It's right. really hard. If you look at the progress we've made already, it's it's interesting, but it's nothing like enough. And part of this is going to be not just about what we do to the energy industry and you know whether we um, eat meat or anything else. It's about the way we live. So the housing stock in the UK is not amenable to district heating, so you can't just suddenly assume that one away. Uh, much of the housing is quite old and it's not very thermally efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have quite a lot of old, really old properties that are uh, conservation properties and we call them listed. Um, you know, the, the restrictions on how you can insulate those is hard. And it's fascinating when you compare housing, uh, building regulations, building standards here with somewhere like Finland, you know, it's completely different. And we right. need to start thinking like that. It's about not just how we generate the power, but how little we can we have to use. So modern houses, which are almost net zero houses, you know, there are there are you can build a house in the UK now, where the energy needs are very 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 low. That's great, but we've got sixty or sixty five million people. You're not going to do that overnight. So in the long run, that sort of transition has to happen. The way we live is changing too. So this is all part and parcel of the of the battle. And long answer to short question, I hope to goodness we can get there, but let us not underestimate how hard this is going to be. But with that, the opportunities that come with it for new jobs, for new technology, for innovation, for creativity, but it needs an absolute level of grit and determination to just make it happen. Absolutely. And with that, Dr. Tim Stone, thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Naomi. That was, uh, that was huge fun and very therapeutic. Thank you.